just before we came on air, I talked to John Kerry, Secretary of State under President Obama and Democratic presidential candidate of 2004. In his book, he writes, I think every day about how we might have closed the wounds in Syria, about how the world might close them still. I asked him if he regrets those wounds were not closed by America when he had the chance. Well, I regret that they weren't closed by the international community. I don't think America was acting alone or capable of, of acting completely alone, though, as I write, we could have had a greater impact on Assad's calculation and perhaps even the Russians' calculation. So we could have made some difference. But really, the international community has failed on Syria as a whole. Uh, right now, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, and Assad are acting with this sense of impunity. Um, they intend to uh, obviously proceed militarily rather than to have taken an opportunity to try to have a political solution. Secretary Kerry, would you admit, though, that America missed critical chances? You write in that book like a man who has deep regrets that he didn't manage to influence his own president towards his way of thinking. Well, that's not a fair, fair, fair statement. I, I hope I influenced the president uh, uh, with respect to a number of options in Syria, including the great latitude he gave me to try to work towards a political solution. But you know that and President Obama was... laid down, forgive me for interrupting, a red line on chemical weapons. You know that Assad crossed that and nothing happened. That was extraordinarily damaging, wasn't it? Well, again, I think you phrased it in a way that doesn't reflect the full situation. The president made the decision to bomb. And your prime minister at the time went to the parliament to seek permission and was denied it. So the president felt that uh, under those circumstances, when his democratic ally had uh, been denied, he, it was important to bring Congress to the table. He never decided not to bomb. What he decided was he needed to have the Congress support that bombing. And we found that Congress was not willing to move. Yeah, but you uh, wanted my, him to go but, faster. But, but wait, 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 let me just finish. Let me just finish. In the meantime, right there in London, when I was standing up with William Hague, I was asked a question about whether Assad could avoid being bombed. Mm. And I said, yes, we could get all of the chemical weapons out of the country. And lo and behold, Lavrov called me. We had a meeting, and we actually negotiated a way to get 1,300 tons of the declared chemical weapons out of the country. So in effect, we got the chemical weapons off the table for a period of time, uh, but you which write we wouldn't have done if we had bombed. Forgive me, I though. do write. You, you I, write very yeah. explicitly, though, that you wanted surprise and speed, and those two elements were missing. Was it cowardly yes. of Obama? No, distinctly wasn't cowardly. He made a calculation about how he thought it would be most effective. We differed with respect to whether or not uh, we needed to hold Assad accountable at various times when I thought we needed to leverage a different outcome and change Assad's calculation and even affect yeah. the Russians' calculation. But and I do write that the way, the way that could have happened, in my judgment, was to provide a cost to Assad for bombing indiscriminately after we had made a ceasefire or even at other times. I thought that, that the West, writ large, not just the United States, but the West writ large, the United Nations, had a serious obligation to the people of Syria I, and to the world to hold him accountable to a higher standard uh, Ultimately, of though, you will understand what I say when, when I quote Trump and others who believe that America is no longer feared, that lines can be crossed, that words don't mean anything, that that has had a profound effect now on America's standing in the world. I think that uh, the worst thing anybody could do in any case whatsoever is quote the current president with respect to how to behave in these kinds of situations. But I would say to you that, yes, it cost us that their perception took hold that the president didn't want to uh, uh, bomb or that he wasn't going to back up his, his red line. But the fact is, by virtue of threatening to bomb, we wound up with an agreement which got all the declared chemical weapons out of Syria and saw the OPCW, the, the Organization of the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, manage the process to get them out, uh, sufficiently impressive in the time of conflict that they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 
that is not insignificant in terms of accomplishment by virtue of what was threatened and yet. I and I underscore, I underscore it yet, yet, it is clear that the administration and the president suffered a uh, perception challenge after that, that he had somehow backed down. But and, it was... and we had to deal with that perception. Okay, but that perception is very, very important because you talked about a big price being paid. And I wonder whether it was that kind of vacillation that has now led to a Trump-style foreign policy. No, I don't think so uh, at all, because foreign policy and, and, and those kinds of choices were not at all a part of the campaign, if you recall. Uh, I think that, uh, and, I, and I think most people in the world are, are very concerned about the way in which the current president approaches foreign policy uh, in this sort of haphazard, quixotic, impulsive way, which is driving our allies away from us. Uh, which is pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, which is, you know, trying to destroy the agreement that still Iran, Russia, China, France, Germany, and Britain are all trying to keep about Iran's nuclear weapons, mm. and, and that is now engaging in a trade war. So I think if people had their druthers around the world, uh, they'd invite President Obama back in a nanosecond. But people are still trying to work out what bought uh, Donald Trump to power and one of them is Barack Obama who reportedly in Ben Rhodes book says what if we were wrong maybe we pushed too far there is a suggestion uh, that a liberal agenda that may have left too many behind do you share that do you think that that's Obama a, had blind spots I think it is completely clear and President Obama spoke to this recently it is completely clear why uh, Donald Trump uh, came out of that election the way he did and, and why there are people who have found in him somebody who can fight for them. And, and that is that Washington writ large, government writ large, it's true in Europe, it's true in other places, that there has been a slow response to the remarkable transformation that has taken place culturally and in terms of the workplace in people's daily lives. People are angry. People are angry on the right, they're angry on the left, they're angry in the center, and because globalization has made uh, some people extremely rich, but it has not seen the average person's income rise sufficiently uh, for the price of and, that. And so in America, when we have 52% of America's income going to 1% of the American people, we have a problem. That is not a sustainable political solution Secretary to anything. I, I wonder whether you whether you accept that you have been a part of that. Your book describes this idyllic, gilded upbringing of Swiss boarding schools and Ivy League and boats and cruises. When you ran against Bush in 2004, his team portrayed you as out of touch, as the, the windsurfing, skiing elite. That was, that was the beginning of what Trump managed so successfully to seal, wasn't it? Well, I think we should have done a better job because that's not me and that's not the response. Yes, I had some privileges when I was young, but all my life has been dedicated to public service. I didn't go chase money the way Donald Trump did. I, you know, I can find a hundred different ways in which I have fought for health care, fought for the average person, stood up uh, for a very different agenda from what we're seeing now. And I am the one who took on the establishment when it came to Iran-Contra and what was happening when it came to BCCI, the bank. Uh, of, of what, what became known as the Bank of Crooks and Criminals, which we shut down. So I don't take a second place to anybody well, in the people I fought for and the things that I've done, well, and I find your question somewhat, uh, you know, strange. I, you know, I, I've just written a book which details an entire lifetime of fighting for justice and fighting for things that are correct. The, the Democrats are seen now, um, the, the election or, you know, the campaign with Hillary Clinton, the Democrats are seen, though, as somehow inside the Beltway, inside Wall Street, and wondering how you think they have to fight now. Is there still a center ground for the, for the left in America? Or has it got to be Bernie Sanders? Has it got to be Ocasio-Cortez? How do the Democrats get back into power? Well, let, let me try to answer that question as directly as I can without playing with labels. I hate labels. I think all this notion of uh, what's there for the center or the left is the wrong way to approach it. What we have to do is make clear to America an agenda that is going to make people's lives better. 
And that means holding on to health care, making sure that health care is there for every single American, not allowing the Republican Party, which it is doing now, to try to undo Obamacare and, and leave people with pre-existing conditions exposed to no health care. What we have to do is continue the fight to have an energy policy that will that will protect planet Earth against what is happening in climate change today. We have to have a foreign policy that is realistic and strong and recognizes that we need to lead on a global basis, just as we have historically, and made a difference in people's lives. We have to have a way of showing that we're not going to let uh, the worker in America, the average worker, work two or three jobs and not be able to take home enough money to be able to pay their bills and make ends meet. And I am absolutely confident that that, that is a shared agenda among all Democrats, and, and people are going to see that agenda carry the day over the course of the next months and beyond, because people are fed up with the privilege that is tearing at the fabric of our society and feeding populist movements around the world that are more authoritarian, yeah. that are actually, you know, not willing to respect democracy and, and build the global international let, let uh, cooperative ask, efforts that we need. Let me ask you, every president leaves a legacy. What do you think at this stage uh, Donald Trump's lasting legacy on America will be? I think that uh, Donald Trump's legacy will be to be qualified as the worst president in American history. And I think that he, while he's had a couple of successes in his agenda, it has not made America safer. It has not made America fairer. And uh, in most people's judgment, because we're not building things, we're not rebuilding America, we're not doing the things we need to invest in the future, we've pulled out of climate change, he's trying to destroy the strongest nuclear arms agreement on the planet. Uh, I think the chaos of this presidency, the tweeting against our Constitution by attacking the Attorney General for not being political in the management of the Justice Department, uh, I think uh, each day for this president is going to get tougher, and I think the American people are going to hold him accountable. John Kerry, thank you very much. Thank you.